Ketamine is the most generic of amino acids with only a methyl or a CH3 group as its side chain or unique part, but that doesn't mean it doesn't play important unique roles. Its genericness makes it really useful in the lab for things like an alanine scan to try to figure out what different amino acids do by changing them to an alanine and seeing what happens. It also plays really unique and special roles in the body where through the glucose alanine cycle, it takes, it allows our cells, our muscle cells to send waste to the liver cells and then the liver cells take that waste and dispose of it and give the muscle cells back glucose so the muscle cells can get more energy. So it's kind of like this trash cycling system. Additionally, alanine wins the most likely to form an alpha helix. Um, so we'll talk more about how alanine structure contributes to the structure of proteins. Speaking of structures, alanine is not as small as glycine, which only had a hydrogen, um, but it's not smallest in addition to making it so that it's less flexible and more like the other amino acids. It also makes it so that it is chiral and chirality refers to handedness, like your left and your right handed how they're like non-superimposable mirror images. We'll talk more about this later, but you can think of it as kind of like that, that methyl group sticking forward or backwards. And so like all the other amino acids, except for glycine, um, alanine has two versions and our body uses one of the versions as do like all the other bodies of organisms. But there's a cool, this L version, but the D version, bacteria actually use that D version to form part of their cell walls. And so we'll talk more about this as well as how that D alanine can kind of get mimicked by antibiotics, the beta lactam antibiotics. So we'll talk more about all of these different things. Um, and more things, all of this uh, is in the discussion that alanine brings. So this is alanine, it's the second amino acid we're going to talk about. And like all of the other amino acids, so like all of these other protein letters, it has the same generic backbone where it has an amino group and a carboxyl group. This is where it gets the name amino acid. These link up through peptide bonds to form chains called polypeptides, which fold up to give you functional proteins. The way that they fold up is dependent on large part on the a unique part of each of those amino acids. So in addition to those generic parts that allow them to link up, they have a unique part, a side chain or R group that sticks off. And these have different properties, big, small, water loving, water hated, charge, not charge, etc. And the protein is going to fold up in a way that's going to accommodate each of the different preferences of the amino acids. Different proteins have different combinations of amino acids and therefore different proteins have different shapes and they can do different things. And all of that is dependent on that primary sequence, that primary structure of the order of the amino acids and which of these side chains that they have. And so in the case of alanine, our side chain is really simple. It's just this methyl group, this CH3 group. It's not as simple as glycine. So glycine just had a hydrogen here. Um, but it is the second smallest. And as we saw in the case of glycine, that hydrogen kind of made it so it was really, really flexible and not very generic. And it could kind of loosen up areas of a protein. Whereas alanine, its side chain is kind of blah. Like it look at if you can just see by looking at all these other ones, they look kind of fancier. And some of them can do different things. They're more reactive or they even have charges. Alanina is pretty blah, but this blahness makes it useful um, for when you want a region of a protein that's basically just given some structural support and stuff. And it can also play other roles. Um, with alanine, it isn't the smallest. Remember, the smallest is glycine, but it's the smallest that is chiral. And so chiral has to do with stereochemistry. So stereo deals with the orientation in space. And when you think about that R group, when you think about, so in this case, the methyl group, this is all, this is in a plane, and this can step forward from the plane or backwards from the plane. And so depending on whether it's forward or backwards, you'll get an L form or a D form. These are like your right and your left hands. They're non-superimposable mirror images. So they're mirror images. And it looks like, oh, you just flip this one over. But if you flip this one over, well, now you're looking at the back of my hand versus the front of my hand. And so those are different. And um, so we call these stereoisomers. 
This idea of chirality is really important. How you have these like different handedness, this is going to influence how the molecule is shaped and therefore what it will bind to and how, um, how other things will play with it. It's not just an issue with amino acids. Amino acids is one place they show up, but you also see it with sugars and you also see it with molecules that we make outside of the lab. And so if you, in, the, in our bodies, we typically, are, all of our, the machinery in our cells is specialized to dealing with one version. So in the case of amino acids, as we'll see, it's gonna be the L version of the amino acids. And so all of the machinery is going to have pockets that are shaped for that. So like having a left-handed mitt or a right-handed mitt, depending on what you want, which the, Say, say L was left handed mitt, left hand, and then you would have like left handed mitts. Well, if you had the other hand, it wouldn't work. But because your body is building up all these parts with these enzymes, with these molecules that are designed to work with specific hands, you have your molecules built up in a specific way. And so it all works out. What happens is that in the, like when pharmaceutical companies or say chemists are just trying to like build up a molecule, they have a really hard time making chiral molecules because if you just mix things in a reaction, mix components in a reaction tube, now things can be, you end up with this like enantiomeric mix where you have these different handed compounds and this can be a big problem. Sometimes those compounds just don't do anything um, like with ibuprofen, like on the wrong, the wrong hand so then you waste a bunch of your yield. Other times, um, they they can cause damage and this is what happens with like thalidomide so one of the versions was helpful and one of the versions was really harmful um and so it, this all has to do with this um this stereochemistry and having these different stereoisomers and so how do you know if something is a stereoisomer well not everything can have a stereoisomer in order to have that you need to have these chiral centers um, or these stereo centers, where basically you have a carbon that's attached to four different things. Now, if you look at um, if you look at glycine, you can see that the alpha carbon, so that's the central carbon, it's attached to four things, but you have two of them are the same because you have two hydrogens. Remember, glycine side chain is a hydrogen, and so it's a chiral. It's not chiral. It doesn't have chirality because it does that isn't attached to four different things, and none of the other atoms are attached to four different things. Um, so you have an achiral molecule, non-chiral molecule. But now you bring in alanine. Well, now alanine, the hydrogen where you had two hydrogens before, now one of those hydrogens is a methyl group. And that methyl group, that carbon, isn't chiral because it's bound to three of them are hydrogens that it's bound to. But that alpha carbon that you just attached to, now it's bound to four different things. Now you have the possibility for those things to be sticking out in opposite directions, now you have the ability for there to be chirality. And you would see this if you were to just try to make these molecules like in a test tube, but in our bodies, because they're being built up from all of these chiral molecules and being worked with all these um, enzymes that are used to working with, that are designed to basically shape to work with those molecules, you end up with having all of this chirality. Um, and so like last year, 2021 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was actually for some scientists who were trying to figure out or who did figure out methods in order to better make ch um, chiral molecules in the laboratory um, or to make like just one version of them. So to make it so you, that you're not getting that mixture. And so when you have those four different things, that's when you have the possibility to have that mixture. And if you have multiple other stereo centers, then you have the possibility for there to not just to be left and right handed versions, but there to be like some where like you have a left finger and a right finger kind of like stitched together. Not a good example, but basically they're not mirror images of one another, but they're different in space. And so you can see this with the example of menthol. You see it has those different more stereo centers and those centers can be oriented in different ways. Speaking of how we represent where the, how these are oriented, we typically use this wedge dash notation where wedge is something that is like coming at you and a dash is something that's going away. Um, and so then everything that's a straight line is just in the plane of the paper and then you have things coming forward and coming back. And so if a stereo center was flipped, you would see those be the opposite direction. If you were to flip all of the stereo centers, so in the case of an amino acid, at least most of them, we only have that one 
potential stereo center. And in this case, since you only have one, if you were to flip it, you would get the mirror image. If you have multiple stereo centers, um, oh, and so we call those enantiomers. When you have these non-stereo, non-superimposable mirror images, we call those enantiomers. Now, what if you have a couple of them that are flipped, but not all of them? Now you get into this term called diastereomers. So this would be when you had like a left thing, one finger was like was like your left finger, but on your right hand, that sort of thing. Like one of the centers, or or not all of the centers at least. So it doesn't look like a mirror image, but it doesn't look the same. You can't superimpose them. They're not the same. Even though all of those atoms are connected in the same ways in terms of like what's linked to what, um, but they're sticking out different ways. And even if you rotate and rotate and rotate, you can't get them, um, you can't get them to line up in the same orientation. Just like you can't kind of like change the orientation of your fingers or you can change the like which position your fingers are in. But if you were to put a ring on all your fingers, you can't just like change the figures try playing around with it with your fingers with rings with um with models if you have them that's the best um but there's a lot about chirality and i'll post i'll link to my post i did um with explaining things more um but yeah so alanine is this is the first that we'll look at that's chiral but they're all chiral except for glycine and a couple of them are going to have a couple extra um stereo centers in their side chain um but we'll get to that complicating fact later and for now just focus on there being the l and the d um the l and the d enantiomers remember we use that term enantiomers when they're mirror superimposable mirror images um and at this we're talking about at that um at that alpha carbon um we can also represent which direction things go with like r and s notation as well as this like plus and minus which refers to like rotation of light and things like this um whereas rns is based on like what has priority in terms of the ordering and i'm not going to get into that sort of thing but for now just know that these four different forms exist our bodies use the l form of amino acids um bacteria use the d form in their walls and that's a cool story that i'll tell you about in terms of the naming so you'll see i have like l l and d l the naming is kind of weird because it's based on this historical precedent um, and it's not actually what it was historically signified or what it signifies in other cases. So when it comes to describing the stereochemistry of amino acids, we use this thing called the LD notation. And this compares the stereochemistry to the stereochemistry of L-glyceraldehyde, which is the simplest sugar. The L and the D originally stood for dextrorotatory and levorotatory. So basically, um, the D would represent that it rotated light to the right, whereas L would, would be that it was rotating light to the left. So the cool thing about enantiomers that I didn't mention before, and so enantiomers remember these are the mirror non-superposable mirror images. When you have an enantiomer, they have the same properties, except like in terms of boiling point and all of that, but they have, they rotate plain polarized light in different directions. And so the machines that you can use in order to see what direction the light is rotated by these molecules. And at least initially they would say, okay, well, this was rotating it to the left. That's a level rotatory, we'll call it L. And this one's doing it to the right, that's dextrorotatory, we'll call it D. Um, and so they did that for the sugars, they did that for glyceraldehyde, and they found that one of these orientations, the L orientation, um, rotated light to the left. And but then what they did was instead of testing all the different other molecules, they just based the notation off of glyceraldehyde. So if it was oriented like glyceraldehyde, they called it L, and if it wasn't, they called it D. But it turns out that not all of the, um, that doesn't always work in terms of what it actually, how it actually rotates the light. So L-alanine is dextrorotatory, um, even though it has an L. Um, and so to avoid this, sometimes you see like a plus or a minus, which is um, referring to the optical activity. So probably more detail than you wanted. Um, and apologies, well, kind of, because, well, if you wanted to notice, then I hopefully it was helpful. But anyway, all the amino acids and proteins are in this L form. But that doesn't mean that the D form can't be found in nature. In fact, this D-alanine makes up a part of the bacterial cell wall. 
So bacteria have these cell walls that are made up of peptidoglycans. Um, so these are what we call glycoconjugates. So they're sugars attached to things. And in this case, they're sugars that are kind of linked together through these peptide chains. And those peptide chains include the alanine. There's an enzyme, so a reaction helper called a transpeptidase. It actually links these chains together. And to do so, it has to attack the D alanine. Now, this is weird because most of the enzymes in our body are, and in the bodies of organisms, are designed to work with the L form because that's what that's what's always used. And so it's easier for our bodies to design these kind of like pockets um, of all these pockets that fit just the L version. But in the bacteria, they have an, the ability to use this D alanine, not for their proteins, but for making these transpep this um this peptide change linkages between the different sugars in the wall. Why this matters is that we can take advantage of this in order to selectively target bacteria cells by weakening their ability to form those walls, making it so that they have weak walls and then they can burst and stuff and they can't grow. This is done by beta-lactam antibiotics as well as some other antibiotics, these penicillin class. This is ampicillin. It kind of mimics that D-alanine, D-alanine attack site. And this way, when the transpeptidase goes to build the walls with it, it attacks it, but then it gets stuck on it. Um, and this inhibits the transpeptidase, so they can't make those strong walls. And so this is how this is how the penicillin class antibiotics work, the beta-lactam antibiotics. What else can we say about alanine? Um, well, kind of more on the boring side, but it's coded for by things starting with GC. So when I'm GCU, GCC, GCA, GCG. When I talk about coded by, this basically means that each of these amino acids, the instructions for which order to place the amino acids in to make a protein are in the messenger RNA. Instructions for making that protein, which are an RNA bird copy of a gene. Each of these is spelled kind of by these three-letter codons, these three-letter amino acid um, words. And if you look at alanine, it's got all of these GC ones. So if your codon starts with the GC, it's going to be an alanine. Okay, so alanine, as I mentioned, its side chain is this methyl group. So when we talk about these different things that we can have as side chains, we're often talking about different functional groups. So basically, amino acids are a form of organic molecules. And so organic just means that it's based off of a carbohydrate skeleton, a hydrocarbon skeleton. So you have kind of like a skeleton of carbons with hydrogens as kind of like space fillers. Um, those hydrogens can get swapped out for more exciting things. And so we'll see throughout 20 days of amino acids, we'll see, we'll see some really fancy groups um, that can do more that, that are more reactive and can do various things. But in the case of alanine, we just have this methyl group. We just have this CH3 group, which is kind of as generic as you can get um, with just adding one more carbon and nothing else. Well, well two more high more hydrogens too, but remember those are kind of like space fillers, which is why in the case of glycine, sometimes it's not even considered to have a side chain because it just has a hydrogen there. Um, why this can be useful, this genericness, is that it's not going to be very reactive. And so if you want to figure out what an amino acid does in a protein, and you want to basically exchange that amino acid for something else, to see, okay, well, does the activity change? Or did I lose the ability to bind? Did I lose the ability to speed up a reaction? You would need, in order to, you can't just take out the amino acid, what well, you could, but then you could be changing the structure of the protein more dramatically. But if you change that amino acid to a different amino acid, well, then you can kind of keep the length of the, side of the protein the same um, while still losing that, um, that amino acid that you want to see what it does. Now, if you were to change it to something reactive, well, then that would be a problem. But if you change it to alanine, well, now you're not going to have that reactivity. And so you can do this thing called an alanine scanner, alanine mutagenesis, where you basically change the amino acids into alanine and see if you change the activity or change the ability to do something. 
you can do this in a single site or you can do this with like with just alum mutagenesis, hydrogen mutagenesis, or you can do like an alanine scan where you go through and you change all the different amino acids to alanines. Now I should mention that alanine, it is not a great mimic for some of these amino acids. And so if you look at like alanine versus tryptophan or alanine versus lysine, you can see that they're going to be um, very different. And so sometimes if you, if you want to test a specific amino acid, you're better off testing something that looks more like it um, in terms of length and things, but it doesn't have the property, one of the properties. So for example, for asparagine, you could, um, if you want to test if the charge was important for aspartate, you could change it to asparagine and that would be um, changing less things than with an alanine, but alanine is often used. Um, and so it's a key tool for structural and functional biology. Um, so structural biology is dealing with the shape of molecules, like the shape of proteins and the shape of protein RNA complexes. And there are various tools that we can use in structural biology, things like cryo-electron microscopy and extra crystallography. And this is going to allow us to get a look at the 3D um, the three D orientation of different molecules, and so here we're not just talking about the stereochemistry. We're not just talking uh, of that one amino acid. We're not just talking about like whether it goes forward or backwards. What we're talking about is the combination of all of these amino acids and where they are in relationship to one another. I mean, uh, proteins often take on these characteristic shapes, things like these beta strands. Um, which can team up into these beta pleated sheets, as well as these alpha helices. And the reason that they form these distinctive structures, um, regardless often of what they, even though they all have, even though proteins all have different sequences, you'll find these same structural units in, in many of them. These are called secondary structural motifs. And they form because the backbone makes characteristic angles and characteristic interactions. And so we can talk about different levels of protein structure, starting with the primary structure, which was just the sequence of amino acids. And then we get a secondary structure where we involve interactions between the backbone. So remember the backbone of all of these is going to be the same. And so when you link it together, what happens is you get this kind of um, this chain of planes with the R group sticking off, kind of like a charm bracelet. The reason why you get these planes is because this amide bond, this peptide bond, when you link these amino acids together, you get this special kind of bond called an amide bond, or um, we can refer to it as a peptide bond um, in the case of the proteins. And what's special about this is it has partial double bonded character. More on this in other posts, but basically these each of these different atoms, these oxygens, hydrogens, carbons, they're made up of smaller subatomic parts. There's a dense central core, which has positively charged protons, neutral neutrons, um, helping glue them together. And then around that, you have a, um, an electron cloud where there's electrons which are negatively charged kind of whizzing around. And these atoms can kind of merge parts of their clouds together share pairs of electrons to form covalent bonds. And so a single bond was when they share a pair of electrons and a double bond is where they share two pairs. What's special about the double bonds is not only are they shorter and stronger, but you also can't rotate around them. So in the case of, the, of this peptide bond, because you have partial double bond character, you can't rotate around it. And so basically you have it so that you're sharing electrons between three things instead of between two things and in order for them all to be able to share, they can't rotate. Um, and so you end up with this chain of planes where you have limited rotation at these various points. And the amount that you can rotate is going to be dictated in part by things like how big and bulky the side chain is. And so this is why we saw that glycine was a bad, um, was bad for in terms of genericness because it introduced a lot of flexibility. It could take on angles that other amino acids can't. Um, but typically there's specific angles that amino acids can take on and the different side chains are going to dictate which they like to take on the most. And so alanine is really good at being these right-handed right alpha helices. And so um, it wins the, an A for um, getting out into alpha helices.
And I also mentioned with the secondary structure, um, these structures, although the angle is important, it's also kind of a, just a side effect. Um, these interactions are going to be um, reinforced by these by this attraction between different elements of the backbone. So the oxygens and the hydrogens on the nitrogens can form what we call hydrogen bonds. And we'll talk more about these in other posts. But these interactions between those backbone atoms are going to be kind of holding things in place. And they're going to be holding things in place around those characteristic angles. But those characteristic angles are going to be limited in part by, by the identity of the side chain. Um, so that is where alanine would be found structurally, and it would also typically be found on the inside of proteins. So alanine is, uh, is what we call hydrophobic. So it's not like super hydrophobic, but it is a bit hydrophobic. And so hydrophobic refers to whether or not it kind of plays nice with water. So water is what we call a polar molecule. And now when we talk about polarity, this refers to the separation of charge. And so this can be full charge or this can be partial charge. So you can get polarity even with a non-charged molecule. You can get the separation of charges because of uneven sharing of electrons. And so remember the electron sharing is how they form these bonds. But some atoms hog the shared electrons. And because the electrons are negatively charged, the parts that hog the electrons are going to be partly negatively charged. And the parts that are getting their electrons stolen are going to be partly positively charged. And so this happens in water. Oxygen is what we call really electronegative. So it hogs those electrons, making the oxygens partly negative and those hydrogens partly positive. Positive and, ne and negative attract one another, and so you get water formed. These kind of like exclusive licks, these inter these networks of water molecules, where in order to let something else into their network, that thing is going to have to have um, qualities that the water like. So they have to have partial or full charge. When we have alanine, we don't have that. Instead, we just have this nonpolar molecule. So carbon and hydrogen they share pretty fairly. And so you don't get polarity. You don't have anything nice to offer the water, and so the water is going to exclude it. And when the water excludes it, then those parts are going to be um, kind of like forced onto the interior of the protein. And so you often find alanine in the interior proteins and in alpha helices. Let's talk a little bit more about how alanine is used in the body. One of its key cool functions is in the glucose alanine cycle. Basically, your muscles build up a bunch of waste. The liver has the machinery for getting rid of that waste. And so the muscles send the waste to the liver. The liver takes care of the waste and sends the muscles back energy. So muscles get a pretty nice deal out of it. In a little more detail, what happens in your muscles is through this process of glycolysis, so the breakdown of sugar, you get this product called pyruvate. And so if you have plenty of time and plenty of oxygen and stuff, this pyruvate um, can then get, um, can then, so this is glycolysis, this pyruvate can then get processed and go through this thing called the citric acid cycle and basically produce a lot of energy through a process called oxidative phosphorylation. And so this would be aerobic respiration. But what happens is if the muscles are, if either there's not enough oxygen or they're just needing to break down sugar really quickly and get a little bit of energy, not go through all this pathway to get the big payout, um, but just kind of stop at pyruvate, what can happen is that you would then have a bunch of pyruvate build up and this would slow things down. So what the muscles can do is instead they can kind of take that pyruvate and they can convert it into alanine. And in order to convert it into alanine, well, if you compare pyruvate and alanine, we're going to need to add an amino group. We can add this amino group from the amino acid glutamate. And so this alanine transaminase is going to take an amino group from glutamate, put it onto pyruvate to give you alanine. And in return, it's going to give you alpha ketoglutarate. Um, and so alanine transaminase is one of many, many transaminases um, that will transfer amino amino groups from an amino acid to, um, 
to alpha glutamate or from um, from glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate, um, and this is going to allow your body to basically move around amino groups. And so, um, these amino groups can, if they are not controlled, you can get toxic products. Um, but if you are able to transfer them in a controlled way, then you're able to safely remove it in your liver through things like the urea cycle. Now, instead of specializing in having um, different transferases for all of these different things, the basic, um, your body's kind of settled on, okay, we'll transfer everything on to alpha glutarate and we'll use glutamate as this kind of like intermediate. And so alpha glutarate is nice too because it's going to be involved in the citric acid cycle. And so we kind of get this thing where we're kind of reusing parts and we have all these interconnectedness of these different networks and I'm specializing so that we minimize the different number of enzymes that we have to use, the different number of molecules that we have to use, um, taking advantage of the things that are the same about them. And so just transferring that amino group from any amino acid onto alpha ketoglutarate to give us glutamate and then reversing it to go the other way. So in the case of alkalinity transaminase or ALT, we're taking the amino group from um, glutamate and transferring it onto pyruvate to make alanine. And this could also go the other direction. And it does go the other direction as we see when we get to the liver. So that alanine is shipped out of your muscles, goes through your bloodstream to your liver. And in the liver, now what's going to happen is you get the reverse reaction. So that the amino group is going to be transferred um, from alanine to alpha ketoglutarate to give you glutamate. Um, so this is a step the reverse of what we saw before. Um, and in addition to giving you glutamate, now we're getting pyruvate back. Um, and this pyruvate, it can then be used for gluconeogenesis. So it can be used to make glucose um, through the citric acid cycle and stuff. Or it can be, uh, it can go through the urea cycle where it can be used in order to um, get rid of it as urea. Um, and this allows you to control um, the transfer and the release of nitrogen. Alanine is what we refer to as non-essential. As we saw, we can make it from pyruvate. So this is what, so non-essential just refers to the fact that the, our bodies can make it. It does not refer to the fact that our bodies need it, our bodies need all of the amino acid. It's just that the essential ones we can make ourselves, whereas the non-essential ones, um, we have to get pre-made through our food, but we can make alanine from pyruvate. We can also use pyruvate, we can also use alanine to make other things. And so as we saw, we can make pyruvate from alanine. Um, so we can go both ways and because pyruvate can then enter the, um, after um, modification can enter the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the scrub cycle, the citric acid cycle, which can be used to make glucose. Alanine can therefore be used to make glucose. And so we call it glucogenic. In terms of the history, um, it's one of two protein letters that was made from scratch, so via synthesis, before it was actually known that it was like a, pro a protein letter. Um, so in 1850, Adolf Strecker um, was made this and purified it and he named it alanin um, using the first syllable of aldehyde. So this is an aldehyde. Um, and so that's where the al in the al alanin comes from. Um, because he had made it from aldehyde ammonia and he was like when he was trying to make find a way to make lactic acid and he kind of accidentally made this um and as for making or for isolating it from a protein um there's a kind of contested history of it but it came from um came from breaking down silk and looking and see what was in it um and so depending on where you look you'll see schutzenberger bourgeois um or theodore wheel um credited with that. Um, but like all science, it's a team effort. Um, and so thank you for the scientists for helping us learn more about alanine. And now alanine is helping us learn more about all sorts of things. So um, remember the key things, some of the key things to remember about alanine, it's side shaping is this methyl or CH3 group. It's the second smallest um, Glycine is the only one that's smaller than it, but it's the smallest that is chiral. And so like all of the other amino acids except for glycine, it's chiral. So it has these right and left-handed versions. Um, in the case of proteins, all of the amino acids are going to be in the L form. 
Um, but bacteria use the D form in some of their walls, but, but the L form is what we use in all of the proteins. Um, and remember the stereochemistry refers to the orientation of the space. Alanine is classified as nonpolar because the carbon and the hydrogen share pretty fairly. You don't have separation of charge. Um, it's likely to be found in alkahelis, and it is just kind of boring looking, but it plays important, unique roles in the body, such as by helping our, body, our muscles get rid of waste in the glucose alanine cycle. So hope that helps you appreciate alanine, and we'll talk more about amino acids in the coming posts.